This park for us is a milestone, our 10th park. Welcome to the Grove of Titans. Inside Redwood National and State Parks. It's official, you are now a bark ranger, Scout. Are you excited, Scout? All my elk dreams came true. We're Howard and Caitlin Newstate. This year, we're traveling to 51 parks in 52 weeks. We're visiting all the U.S. national parks in the lower 48 in a special Winnebago Vista limited edition. Each week, we're sharing where to stay, what to do, and introducing you to the people doing incredible work across our national parks. Redwood National and State Parks is one of the most unique park systems in the country. In 1968, Redwood National Park was established, adjacent to three existing state parks. Several years later, in 1994, the California Department of Parks and Rec and the National Park Service entered into a joint agreement to manage all four parks together in order to make the most of protecting the land, animals, and resources within the parks. There's about 71,000 acres of federally protected land and 60,000 acres of state land. And of course, you'll find plenty of the majestic namesake trees that are the tallest on the planet. We'll learn all about the ancient redwoods in today's episode, but there's a lot more than tall trees here. We're going to explore beautiful beaches, magical fern canyons, watch incredible coastal elk in their environment, and Scout is even going to help us show you how you can explore redwoods with your furry family members. There are several options for camping inside the parks depending on the length of your RV and the time of year. Some campgrounds don't open until the summer season. There are plenty of private campgrounds and hotels in nearby towns for you to choose from. Because the park spans such a large area of the coast, we would definitely recommend a minimum of three days here in Redwood National and State Parks. Once we got our Winnebago all set up right along the Klamath River, we headed to the Visitor Center at Prairie Creek State Park to grab our usual sticker, magnet, and a map. Okay, we're all set. We got our visitor center hall, and look at this. There is a Trivial Pursuit for National Parks. We just picked this up. By the time this tour is done, we should be experts in this, and we should be able to beat anyone regarding Trivial Pursuit National Park knowledge. <laughs> I know, who wants to challenge us to a game? No one, <laughs> no one will want to challenge us after this one. So right now we are over, Wait. You are here. Oh yeah, <laughs> so right now we're here. <laughs> right now we're here at Prairie Creek and we're getting ready to head over to Fern Canyon. So we're going to be heading south on Davison Road and then taking this along Gold Bluffs all the way to Fern Canyon. And everything we've heard or seen, it is magical. So national park passes are accepted. You're supposed to leave your pass on the dashboard instead of paying for the day use inside of a California state park. This is a wild park. There's this like massive cliff wall that we just drove by and there are pine trees that are growing vertically on the side of the cliff. I have never seen anything like that. Okay, so this is the day use parking for Gold Bluffs Beach. If you do not have a higher clearance vehicle, a four by four, or you just don't feel comfortable crossing two separate creeks in your vehicle, you can park here and hike the rest of the way to the trailhead. All right, action cam. We're going to get out and assess the situation of the stream crossing. <laughs> yeah. So this whoa, over here is pretty shallow. Yeah. Don't go over there. No, that side's very deep right now, or deeper. I mean, it's not very deep. So it's been raining, as you're probably aware. California has been under a tremendous amount of unusual weather for months. And so everything is higher. The lakes, reservoirs, creeks, and rivers are much higher than normal. You should be checking ahead of time for road conditions, trail closures, and all of that anywhere along the Western coast. Okay, here we go. Stream number two. Easy as pie. But yeah, that one was- The first one is legit. You gotta make sure, in my recommendation, if it's still the same, you want to be all the way to your left when you are driving towards the canyon. So this trail actually requires you to hike in water. And we just heard from another hiker who came off the trail that the water right now is about six to 12 inches deep. And he said there's also elk along the trail. So I'm hoping that they're still there and we might catch a glimpse of them. Okay, we're here at the trailhead for Fern Canyon. This is approximately a mile round trip and is the scene that has been used in Jurassic Park 2 and a number of other movies. It is ethereal, it is insta-famous. We are heading there now. <laughs> the sign. What, aggressive elk again? Yeah. I'm kind of nervous, maybe I don't want to see elk. Well, you don't want to be on the pointy end 
ever. <laughs> no. This is such a unique spot. Wow. Yeah, because the ferns grow on the sides of the canyon walls. Very pretty. I'm excited. Mm -hmm. Whoa, look at the elk prints. Oh, wow. See that? Yeah. Oh, man, they're out here. Woo! That's exciting, guys. I love nature. Kind of nervous, too, though. What? I'm kind of nervous, too. Why are you nervous? For the elk. Ah. It's a lot of warnings. Wow. Look at that. Yeah, there's moss growing on everything here. Yeah. Stop signs, guardrails. Wow. Guys, we just heard something huge crashing through these trees. The elk? Oh my gosh. Holy cow. Howard, here. Oh my god. The elk right now is about 50 feet off the trail. He keeps looking, he keeps at, looking us. at us. It is beautiful. Bye, there he goes. All right, let's keep walking. Okay, come on. That really was incredible because we could hear it before we could see it. And it was this huge like crashing sound through the trees. And then we round the corner and there it is. And elk are just, if you've never seen one in person, they are so much bigger than I think you can imagine. They're just massive and just so magnificent looking with their big antlers. It really was neat to see them on the trail. This is so beautiful already. Wow. Is that Caitlin? Oh my gosh. You have to like get up real close, but it's just like watching all of the water drip and all of these ferns are just completely saturated with water and it is so incredibly beautiful. We're about to round this corner and I peeked a little bit and I can see more of the canyon walls and they're all just completely covered in these beautiful green ferns. And then you've got the babbling creek and it's just ethereal. You got it, Caitlin. High five. Woo. <laughs> Just when you think it can't get any more beautiful, you come around the corner and here's a waterfall. Look at this. The sun is starting to come out. The rays of sunlight across the ferns. Wow. <laughs> you can definitely tell why it's so popular. It is beautiful any direction that you film. It is beautiful every direction that you look. There's tons of ferns on the wall. There's dripping water, there's waterfalls, there's a babbling creek. It's like everything you would need for some type of nature Instagram photo. Also, heed this warning. Your feet will get wet. Yeah. <laughs> Your feet will get wet. Your feet will get wet. Bring a change of shoes, change of socks, whatever you need to do but it's worth it. This has been incredible. It's a great, great stop. I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, Howard did most of the planning for this national park slash state park. And so I don't know as much about this one as he does, which is kind of fun going into it like a little blindly because everything is a surprise. Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> All my elk dreams came true. We came off the trail and I think there were about 20 elk just grazing and eating the leaves and it was so cool to see. And they're just sitting there and they're like looking at us and we're looking at them, we're keeping our distance. And it's just so neat to see them in their natural habitat out here. There's one right there. Did you hear that? One of them like made a call. There's one right there, Kayla. There's a bunch, there's some more over there. So this is the big tree pull-off. As the name indicates, big tree is behind me. It's along the circle trail. It's all paved and it's a half mile round trip. Anyone can do this. 
Big Tree is one of the most easily accessible ancient redwoods. At 286 feet tall and about 1,500 years old, it's an incredible sight to see. But Big Tree certainly isn't the biggest of the bunch. Redwoods can exceed 300 feet in height and can live for about 2,000 years. After checking out some of the big trees in the south, we headed north to meet up with Kyle Buchanan from California State Parks to learn even more about the incredible redwood forest. My name's Kyle. I've been working for California State Parks for about eight years now. Um, started down in Southern California working wetlands and have worked in the desert and now I'm in the redwoods. My forest walk is called Morning of the Earth from the treetops to the raindrops, it all matters. I want people to think about the forest as more of a community. Every entity, all the trees, all the bushes, all the flowers, all the fungus networks, everything, uh, the wildlife is a community of things interconnected, working together to accomplish just this forest that we see today. This is often the question that derails any work meeting for <laughs> the Redwood National and State Parks is, is this one tree or two trees? And this is kind of something that sets redwoods apart from other trees in that sequoia family, is that redwoods will grow and then create these burls on the outside of them. And they, they're often those weird growth looking things. And these burls are filled with seedlings. And when that redwood tree feels a certain amount of stress, it will shoot out a clone of that redwood tree. So what we're seeing right now is difficult to really call one tree or two trees. But one thing we know for sure is that they are genetically identical. So they are clones of each other, whether you want to call it one tree or two trees, up to you. And you can see these ones down here, they'll sprout and they'll stay in the shade and they're fairly shade tolerant at that age. And then when they do get the opportunity to get some sunlight and start growing and metabolize that nutrients, the redwood trees will shoot straight up and they'll grow faster than a foot a year in those first couple 50 years of of just trying to get to that the top of the, the canopy and get that sunlight. And once they get up there and start accessing sunlight a little better, they'll focus on bulking and getting wider and wider. But it really depends on what situation that redwood tree's in. Because if that redwood tree has a lot of water, it's close to the river like these redwood trees are. And if it's getting a lot of sunlight, maybe it's on the edge of this redwood area or a tree fell next to it and it's getting all that sunlight, then that redwood tree is going to grow a lot faster. And this kind of makes it also hard to age a redwood tree. You can't really tell just on general size. You really have to turn to cording and that's what some of the researchers are doing nowadays. Taking about a sliver that's maybe a pencil's thickness at let's say 10 feet and then 50 feet, 100 feet, 150 feet and using equations to find how old that redwood tree is at the base. Well, we just learned an amazing amount of information about redwood trees that I had no idea about. Kyle was a wealth of information, but he also has such a profound respect for the inner workings of the forest and how it is symbiotic and how these redwoods all work together, uh, not just to uh, help each other grow, but also to protect each other. And we learned also interesting things about how their root system only goes down, what, about 10 feet? Which is just amazing to think about when you see how tall these grow. I mean, it just doesn't make sense from a physics standpoint that the 10 foot root system would support a tree that tall. But when he described how they're interconnected and interlacing underneath, that's what makes it make sense. We also saw a redwood that had fallen, but was still alive and its clones had shot up from each one of the burls and the burl was way up the tree. And so it's like it's suspended in midair and growing straight up from there. Just yeah. absolutely incredible. The idea of the cloning is such an interesting and unique phenomenon. And once you actually like step back and look at the clones, it's just fascinating. If you get the chance to do one of the forest walks, do it. It's offered at two locations. We're here at Stout Grove and it's also offered at Prairie Creek. One of my favorite things that we learned on the forest walk was what you can look for to help you figure out like how long a fallen tree has actually been there. It's like look for the moss growing and look for other plants growing on it and that will indicate that it has probably been there for a very long amount of time in order for all of these things to benefit from the nutrients that still exist within that fallen redwood. And speaking of the nutrients, Kyle was telling us that the nursery trees, meaning the trees which have fallen, can continue to release their nutrients into other plants for over 800 years, which is just mind-blowing. And in some cases, 
they are supporting other life for as long as they were alive. <laughs> it's really crazy to think about this forest and how there's only 4.6% of it left and that the rest of it had been logged and it was no one's fault, not even the loggers. I mean, it was a call during that time period to, to log and continue construction of certain areas, but it really raises the importance of what we have today and restoring the bits of redwood forest that we also have, creating a connected corridor from the north all the way to the south of Redwood National and State Parks. And that's really the reason that I think a lot of people are here working really hard is not because of the old growth sections. I mean, it's amazing to walk through these areas, but it's that restoration factor. I really try to avoid highlighting the old growth as something that is from the past and, and this ancient forest. Although it is, and it really is beautiful in that light, I, it just makes it feel too much of like a dinosaur to me when really this is something we have today and something that we can protect. That really raises the importance of all the restoration and focusing on being stewards of the land. With such a small percentage of the Redwood Forest left, the National Park Service and California State Parks have come together with Save the Redwoods League on a major restoration project called Redwoods Rising. Over the next several decades, the program will restore more than 70,000 acres of California's redwood forests. There's a huge swath of forest here that was logged. So here in the parks, we have about 120,000 acres of redwood forest, but two thirds of that, we're talking almost 80,000 acres, was compromised by logging before it was established as a park. It's a compromised landscape. Timber companies were required by the state of California, as they are required in most other states, to uh, replant or reseed what they have harvested. And then in many cases, they drop their own seed mix out of helicopters just raining millions of seeds out of the sky. And what that did in, in a clear cut area where there were no, no more trees, everything sprouts at the same time. All plants love the sun. And what it's created is an unnatural density. What is a healthy old growth forest? You know, you could say, well, maybe a hundred redwood trees and maybe some other trees uh, per acre. In some of our plots, we can have over a thousand trees per acre, even up to 2000 trees per acre. And then what you're looking at are skinny, what they call dog hair forests. They're these toothpick forests, so dense that you can't even walk through them. There's not enough space for them to grow. And none of those trees are reaching their full potential. And left to their own devices, it would take a long, long time for the forest to thin itself out. And uh, we don't wanna wait that long. <laughs> we wanna speed up this process because there's something that coast redwoods are now famous for. And it's not just that there are some of the tallest trees on the earth, it's that they store more carbon per acre than any other forest on planet earth. There used to be 2 million acres, 96% of the redwoods were cut down. Imagine how much more carbon could be sequestered if we had those 2 million acres. And by thinning the forests, geologists, hydrologists, foresters, they come out here, they assess the trees, they measure them all, and they take out the little ones and leave some of the big ones behind. And, and it kind of looks like a disaster zone here, but what's going on here is for the better. We're speeding up the process so that those trees that we leave behind, that we leave standing, like what you see, are some of the bigger trees that already had a head start. And so they are now gonna probably grow a little bit bigger more quickly and start sequestering that, that carbon. In the next few decades, they will start mimicking what is the old growth force, what it should look like. And that's gonna improve the habitat for all the organisms that live here. The, not just the animals, but the plants, the fungi. We're giving nature a head start. We have creeks here that are buried up under up to eight feet of sediment that haven't seen the light in 70 years. Well, a lot of these creeks in our parks were prime salmon and trout breeding habitat, which was compromised. There's a creek called Strelo Creek that creek was buried under sediment for almost 70 years. And last June, they removed it. They bring in heavy equipment, they remove that dirt, they expose the creek to the light. And six months later, one of our geologists got video of two cutthroat trout spawning in that creek. Wow. That is a success story. You know, it's amazing how resilient nature can be if given the chance. We're here at the Grove of Titans, which is an awesome success story of stewardship by the parks, because originally there wasn't a trail here. Oh, very cool. Wait, is that a real bird? Is it? Yeah, it's a real bird. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Caitlin, that's a real bird. It's a real bird. That's not a real bird. That is not a real bird. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a real bird. <laughs> I thought it was. I was like, oh, he's just trying to stay warm up there. 
No. Not, not a real bird. Not a real bird. But there are these great interpretive signs along this trail, so you can learn a whole bunch of interesting things as you're walking. This map is really neat because it shows exactly along the coast, a very small section of where these coastal redwoods are found. And these are among some of the oldest living organisms on the planet. That's why we love doing ranger led programs because we can learn things that we then can apply when we're out in nature experiencing it for ourselves. This is an example of an octopus tree. And so the roots, or tentacles have grown over top of this fallen redwood and are absorbing all of the nutrients that still live within the redwood. What's up? We're going like through a makeshift tunnel that a redwood has inadvertently created and that's part of the trail. Hashtag thanks redwood. Oh no, look at this. Wow. Oh, this is so cool. <gasps> this is awesome. Wow. Caitlin, is that your first redwood tunnel? <laughs> yeah, I think so. We're in this like network of all of these different branches and ferns and moss and redwood. We have reached the start of the elevated boardwalk and there's a beautiful welcome sign with these two pillars and I can already see some big trees. What is this? It's the Humboldt Martin, of course. Oh, the Humboldt Martin. <laughs> oh. What is a Martin, Caitlin? Look how adorable he is. Oh, hi, guy. Good, yeah. <laughs> it's a banana slug. I love all of these animals that they have at these little overlooks. I was reading earlier that the banana slug will eat everything that it comes across except for redwood seeds and seedlings. Really? Yeah, that's what the sign said. Why, banana slug? Why? <laughs> Excited. We're taking Scout on a very important mission into the National Park this morning. Come on, Scout. All right, we have Scout's Bark Ranger tag here, and she's going to get sworn in as a Bark Ranger. Come on, honey. Hello there. Hi. Hey there, Scout. So this is our Bark Ranger brochure. So we like to share with the public some of the dog rules, pet rules, where you can take your dog, where you can't. So we have this little pledge that you can say on behalf of your dog. As a Redwood Bark Ranger, I promise to protect my park, sniff new things, and take my human on adventures among the tallest trees in the world. Can you handle that, Scout? <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. So okay. you, you can put that on there. You know what I like to do? I'm going to uh, personalize this. Scout, and then I will sign my name here. Yeah. Ranger Steven. <laughs> Big. And we got to make it official with an NPS cancellation stamp here. Yay! It's official. You are now a Bark Ranger Scout. Are you excited, Scout? Yay! I know. Good girl. Well, Scout is officially sworn in as a Bark Ranger. There are several national parks that offer this program. So if you're heading to one with your dog, make sure you check it out and see. They all do it a little differently and put their own spin on it. It is really cool. And there are beaches here that are dog friendly as well as paved and gravel roads. You ready, Scout? You ready? Scout. Scout, we're gonna do something very special. Once a month, and it just happens to be when we're here, they close the scenic highway and it's only open to pedestrians, dogs, and bikers. And so we're gonna go and walk Scout, now that she is a bark ranger, <laughs> through the redwoods. Are you ready? Look, you're sitting so good and pretty in your jacket. All right. It's so cool that they do this because you're able to explore some of the really big, unique trees that you'd otherwise just be driving by. So make sure you check the calendar, and if you get lucky and happen to be here during one of those special Saturdays, you're in for a treat. She doesn't like it. Scout is just enjoying being with us. She does not seem to be very impressed by the massive trees that we are so impressed by. <laughs> A little perk about the road being closed is that you can get really amazing photos on the road with all these big trees. We just took some of the best family photos with Scout. They're so cute. 
We go black sand beach. What do you think? Lincoln Scout. Isn't that beautiful? I love this. This is so pretty. It reminds me a lot of the Oregon coast. And I know we are very close to the state line, so it makes sense, but it's just gorgeous. <laughs> All fun again. What happened? I did exactly what Stephen told us not to do. What? I turned my back to the ocean and it got me. It got gotcha. you. My foot is more wet right now than it was on the Purdy Kingman trip. <laughs> Next week, we head across state lines and head straight for the crown jewel of Arizona, Grand Canyon National Park. We'll show you how to hike, bike, take a train, or a mule as you explore this world-famous hole in the ground. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next week.